teaches us to solve those problems. I don't know if you know the name Norman Ernest Borlaug. Died uh, just a few years ago. He saved an estimated one billion lives by creating agriculture and be able to grow food on land that would otherwise not be able to grow food. Regarding climate change specifically, this is nothing new. I worked in the alternative energy field in the 1970s, and we were aware the physics is simple. It's simple. As Dan and as Daniel Patrick Moynihan so eloquently put it, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but they are not entitled to their own facts. <laughs> Man-made global warming due to hydrocarbon burning is a fact. The transition to abundant renewable energy, my old field, is in fact the solution. How abundant? I worked in large-scale solar energy plants. A single bombing range, a single bombing range in Nevada could supply all the electrical needs of the United States with technology that now is 20 or 30 years old. The only question is economics. Today we subsidize hydrocarbon burning and we don't account for its true cost to society. Our economic system and our political system lead to short-sighted decision-making. The politicians would have us believe that this is a liberal versus conservative issue. This is why it is so critical that religious voices, especially conservative religious voices, speak to these concerns. Beginning on March 2nd, I'm going to be teaching, very exciting for me, an online course in science and religion. Um, if any of you are interested, I can tell you more about it after the program. Four, four uh, sessions of an hour and a half each. Many would say religion and science are incompatible, that they address two separate worlds and they don't have much to say to each other. I would argue that they are compatible. In fact, I would go much, much further. I would say religion needs science to do its job, and science needs religion to do its job. Religion needs science. If the purpose of religion is to make this world a better place, especially as emphasized in Judaism as tikkun olam, then we better understand how the world works, right? If I'm a bitten by a mosquito, yes, pray for me, but I want this gentleman to be researching how to solve that problem <laughs> so that my doctor can help me. And science needs religion. If science is to achieve its goal of expanding our understanding of the world around us and making improvements in our way of living, Humanity better survive. We better survive the risk of nuclear, chemical, and biological warfare by learning and living by the ethical truths taught by religion. Science and technology are amoral. They operate outside the world of morality. A blade, a knife, can be used to kill, to murder, and to heal. With the advent of nuclear weapons, the ability to damage is unlimited. Each thermonuclear bomb has the explosive power of all the explosives used in all the wars in history, each bomb. A hundred such explosions would destroy life on Earth as we know it. And there are thousands of warheads today. The United States and Russia have some 10,000 today, down from 60,000 warheads in the 1980s. I believe that the only barrier to use of such weapons and other weapons of mass destruction is religious ethics. You know, the word religion comes from the same root word as the word for ligament, that which binds us together. Religious leaders working with scientists must provide the inspiration to address the challenges that scientific development has created so that we may enjoy the fruits of these advances. Shalom Aleichem. Salam Aleichem. Peace be upon you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, try a follow-up question that's not going to be a nice one, okay? Uh, it is that it is, on the one hand, uh, wonderful for religious traditions to talk in glossy terms. It's another thing for them to punch through where problems exist. It's one thing uh, to say that we adhere and love nature, 
but only have sought to do something about it relatively recently because we're running against the edges of the kind of problems. There is in each one of the faiths, I think, a good deal <coughs> of uh, passages that talk about dominion over the planet. They talk about uh, multiply of uh, the seed to do a variety of things. We are now at a point where I think the uh, speakers would agree in terms of fossil fuels, in terms of the approaches that we employ, it's not particularly wholesome, not particularly healthy, and not particularly long-term. What does religion do when more than half of its adherents, congregants, don't believe that, first of all? And secondly, there is beyond the fossil fuels, the insidious role of population. It wasn't until 1800 that there were one billion people on this planet. 200 years later, there are six billion. By 2016, this year, there are 7.6 billion people, with the estimate being to be 12 or more by the end of this century. Can you control climate without having some population control? And if you don't have population control, the people who will suffer the most are not likely to be the people who are sitting in this room. In part because we're not going to be here, but that, that's, that's another issue. Well, I hope so. I hope for you. <laughs> uh, it, it is that over time, third world countries are the ones that suffer the most. The poor suffers the most. The marginalized uh, suffers the most. And so one of the questions I'm asking for uh, each of the uh, presenters is to talk a little bit about uh, is this a change that occurs now because we are pressing the environment to such a degree and it's clear that there are colossal consequences? And what in terms of, of the typical kind of fossil fuel issue, what in terms of population issues, does your religion speak to? And what can it do? In whatever enthusiastic order you like. Is this working? Working? So you mentioned like 10 or 20 points in there. <laughs> Which one do we address? Each one. If you don't have quality, you have quantity, right? OK. Well, you said that one of the problem is really that many people deny uh, the problems that we're having uh, with the environment. And I think this has to be the start before you start addressing the issue of overpopulation, is that to recognize that we have a problem. Now, how do you deal with the fact that most or half of the people still don't recognize that? I mean, ideally, ignorance, and I'm not saying it in a derogatory way, just basically, seriously, is dealt with through education. But that's not really how human work most of the time. It's not just education, it's emotions a lot of the time. So somebody, maybe a religious figure or an ideological figure told them there's no such thing as a global warming, they're gonna basically take that until eventually reality imposes itself. And I think that's what we're going through today. I mean, these teachings that I mention as well as my fellow panelists have been around for a long time. I mean, right? I mean, it comes, they come from the religion, but we're addressing them today because basically we are forced to. That's really the way it is, and I think eventually it's going to catch up with us. And like I said, the problem is going to be uh, enforcing itself, whether we like it or not. When we see the problem with the polar bear population, with the melting of the ice caps, with the changing of the insect, uh, you know, fauna and the flora changing, everything is changing, it will be too much to deny. It will be too striking, and the damage will be too big for us to deny. Uh, what can we do? I think just continue meetings like this. This is the start, at least. And that's really what we can control. Like I said, we're only responsible for our own actions. And until people recognize that, we just have to accept them for what they are. Accept them for their own beliefs, whether we agree with them or not. Like I said, hoping that sometimes reality will wake them up. And it has to start with that, I would say, before getting into the problems, uh, the 20 problems that you mentioned after that. <laughs> One of the biggest problems, it seems to me, is that the 
you know, I think the facts are clear. The problem is that the solutions are very difficult and painful. And most politicians don't want to look at them. It reminds me of the story that a guy who loses something very valuable is looking for it over here, and all of his friends are looking over here, and his friends ask him, are you sure you dropped it here? He said, no, I dropped it over there. He said, so why are you looking over here? He says, well, the light is better here. I can't see it. <laughs> so we've decided that the solutions to these problems are not acceptable because they involve serious sacrifice. So therefore, we're going to ignore the problem, then we'll look in a different place. Our religious traditions, all of them, are based on the idea 